Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Revive webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARD-P. My name is Astrid Pence moore and I'm hosting today's webinar about new clinical trial designs for evaluation of antimicrobial agents. Revive is GARD-P's education and outreach program, and it aims to connect and support the antimicrobial discovery, research and development community by facilitating learning, connecting people, and sharing knowledge. The REVIVE webinars are part of our educational activities. All webinars are recorded in full and can be later found on our website, revive.gardp.org slash webinars. Here you will also find announcements of our future webinars, as well as the registration links. Another form of content we have on our website are our antimicrobial viewpoint articles. These are written by GARDP internal or external experts on various topics related to AMR. If you would like to write a viewpoint in the future, you can please send us an email with your proposal. Something else we have on our website is our antimicrobial encyclopedia. This was launched at the end of last year and it provides short definitions for key terms in the field, as well as selected further reading materials. Some terms are further explained by expert videos. Today we will have two presentations, which will be followed by one Q&A session at the end. You can submit your questions by uh, entering in them in the questions window in your webinar control panel. And if your question is addressed to a specific speaker, please include their name. We will do our best to respond to as many questions as possible. So today's speakers are David Patterson and Julie Marsh, and our moderator is Thomas Snelling, Professor of Infectious Diseases and Director of the Health and Clinical Analytics Lab at Sydney School of Public Health at the University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, welcome, Thomas. I would now hand over to you to introduce uh, our first speaker. Thank you very much, Astrid. Um, it's a, a great pleasure um, today to introduce uh, two colleagues um, from, from Australia. Uh, the first speaker today is Professor David Patterson. Um, David is an infectious diseases physician with a major interest in antimicrobial resistance. He's worked clinically in three continents, in North America, Europe, as well as in Australia. He is currently the director of the University of Queensland Centre for Clinical Research in Brisbane, Australia. He is the author of more than 500 peer-reviewed publications, including those of the Merino trials, which he leads. I'm now happy to welcome David. Uh, David, you can start your presentation now. Thank you very much, Tom, for that uh, introduction. And I'd like to uh, give an overview of some of the innovations in clinical trials of antimicrobial agents. So uh, as all of you uh, have seen from the introductions, the speakers are all from Australia. So g'day from, from all three of us. And Australia, I think, is unique because uh, historically, this banknote is now out of date. But I think Australia is the only country where the discovery and development of antibiotics was celebrated on a, a banknote. And that, of course, is Flory, and there's pictures of Fleming's uh, plate and uh, some um, disc diffusion testing and molds and mice. So, you know, antibiotics in Australia really do uh, go together. So, you know, the, the aim really, I think, for both Julie and I is to consider how we can avoid catastrophes in antibiotic development, such as was seen with Achaeogen. And the part of the, the issue, and it's, it's only part of the issue, of course, with Achaeogen, is uh, in their plazomycin trial, they only managed to enrol 37 patients. And, you know, despite um, millions and millions of dollars, and I don't know the, the reality, but some people have speculated that it was, you know, over a million dollars per enrolled patient in, in 
their uh, CRE trial. And clearly, you know, if you spend that amount of money on just a small number of patients being enrolled, um, that is going to contribute to a lot of expense in drug development and an expense that you may well not recoup uh, when the product finally comes to, to market. And of course, um, you know, most people know that unfortunately, uh, Kagen is a, a thing of the past. So that's you know one of the the lessons we have clearly learned in antibiotic development, and one of the possibilities for making um, clinical trials in antibiotics and potentially in vaccines less expensive is utilising pre-existing clinical trials networks, and certainly. Uh, Clinical trial networks are best known for investigator-initiated trials. And here in Australia, um, they're really quite prolific. There's over 30 clinical trial networks. This was a, a perspective piece from the Medical Journal of Australia recently published. And it really demonstrated that clinical trial networks can provide net economic benefits to health systems. And the way that that occurs is that basically uh, as a result of observational data, there is the identification of variation in, in treatment outcomes. And therefore use that data to generate hypotheses, put those hypotheses to test in randomized clinical trials, as a result, uh, develop evidence-based guidelines and therefore influence health uh, practice policy and of course with regard to antibiotics, antibiotic stewardship. And, and that's really uh, you know, part of the virtuous cycle uh, of investigator-initiated trials conducted by clinical trial networks. So one uh, example that uh, I have led was the Merino trial. And this was put together by the Australasian Society for Infectious Diseases Clinical Research Network. And so uh, we surveyed infectious diseases physicians, what were the questions that they really wanted to answer. And with regard to gram negatives, uh, our colleagues said, well, we really don't know what to do when we have an ESBL producer in the blood and it is reported as susceptible to piperacillin and tazobactam. Can we continue piperacillin and tazobactam or should we uh, up the ante and go to meropenem as definitive treatment? And in that uh, particular trial, we started with our network in Australia and New Zealand, but soon we actually went internationally. And because it was a trial run by infectious diseases physicians, it was really a cooperative enterprise amongst infectious diseases physicians. We were able to successfully complete the trial with fewer than $5 million in, in funding. And that was to enrol almost 400 patients. So something that really is out of the realms of possibility using commercial uh, CROs, but a highly impactful trial. And in fact, I've recently seen data where uh, in actual real life practice in the United States in 2021, fewer than 5% of uh, antibiotic prescriptions when there was an ESBL producer in the blood by day four was their continuation of piperacillin and tazobactam. And that I think is because in the Merino trial, we found that mortality was lower if a patient received meropenem. Well, what uh, clinical research networks are out there specific to antimicrobial resistance or the, the more general field of infectious diseases? And I'd like to point out three of them. In the United States, there's the Antibiotic Resistance Leadership Group, the ARLG, which is run uh, pri primarily from uh, the Duke University Clinical Research Institute. Uh, Vance Fowler from Duke and Chip Chambers from UCSF uh, lead the ARLG. And at the present time, they've got uh, 
two randomised trials where they're uh, intersecting with industry. Industry are providing um, free drug, but the NIH is providing the, the funding for the con conduct of those trials. In Europe, Mark Bonton and Herman Goosens uh, lead the recently renamed European Clinical Research Alliance on Infectious Diseases, ECRADE, which uh, in a previous uh, formulation, Combacta was able to uh, perform a number of randomised trials, and I'm sure with ECRADE we'll see many more to come. And finally, I would like to introduce the the Welcome Asian Drug Resistant Infections Clinical Research Network, which is a nascent network. It's being set up uh, at the moment, but its real purpose is to go to where the action is. We uh, know that a lot of carbapenem resistance, for example, is found in uh, Asia, particularly amongst low and middle income countries, but also in, in um, more um, affluent countries in Asia. But this network will be conducting clinical trials of antibiotics relevant to antimicrobial resistance where the action is and hopefully it will be able to recruit very successfully uh, into trials, for example, of treatment of carbapenem resistant organisms. So I do feel that clinical trial networks are a way of being able to enable uh, trials of new antibiotics uh, potentially much less expensively and also with uh, a bit more agility than what we've seen in the past. So I'm now going to switch to uh, introduce a, a number of um, concepts, fairly new concepts in, in clinical trials of antimicrobials, all of which have a central aim, which is to make clinical trials more efficient. Now by that I mean we can potentially enrol fewer patients, and obviously that would bring costs down. We could have fewer exclusion criteria, in other words, making them more pragmatic, and potentially we can get our studies done uh, quicker and really getting results uh, that are relevant to clinicians or regulatory authorities or the industry uh, in, a, in a much shorter time frame. So I'm going to start with the multi-arm, multi-stage trial design. And the I guess really the, the landmark study with this design has come from the, the field of prostate cancer. So the STAMPEDE uh, trial, which has been running, as you can see, continuously for uh, more than 15 years, started with uh, six different arms, a standard of care arm and then five different comparator arms, all going head to head. And then over time, one of the particular arms, arm C, was found to be associated with uh, improved outcomes from prostate cancer. And so it became the new standard of care arm. And that went to head, head to head with two um, new potentials, arm G and arm H. And then a, a subsequent arm was introduced. And so the potential is that in these um, multi-arm studies, we can have a perpetual trial, always trying to up the ante on what is the standard of care. And so potentially you can have multiple, multiple comparators uh, going head to head, um, really trying to push the, the envelope in terms of you know, what is going to be um, the ultimate standard of care. And obviously as new therapies emerge, that may change over time. With the uh, title multi-arm, multi-stage, it obviously raises the prospect that we could have a seamless integration of phase two and phase three studies with this particular study design. Now, it might be that in phase two, we're testing the same drug, but with different dosage regimens, 
or it could be with different combinations. But through interim analyses, we could potentially drop poorly performing regimens and move ahead only with the better regimens, uh, eventually coming out with what we could potentially be utilising for um, a, a really rigorous phase three uh, trial. So I won't go into more detail uh, about MAMS, but clearly is a, uh, a potential um, a potentially useful uh, trial design. I understand that there are some tuberculosis trials that are, are really moving ahead using a, a MAMS design, and we'll really um, look at those with, with great interest. Now, one of the other um, possibilities is that we can make trials more efficient by having better endpoints. And this trial has got nothing to do with infectious diseases, but I thought it was quite interesting in that it gives an example of ordinal outcomes. And so you can see in this particular trial, um, again, nothing to do with infectious diseases or antibiotics, but the primary outcome was looking at levels of disability on a, a six point scale, with zero being no symptoms at all, right through to six being death. And that's quite attractive because potentially we could think of uh, modifications for endpoints um, of uh, antibiotic trials. And in fact, this has been done uh, Scott Evans and also Chip Chambers have popularised this and Scott has come up with the acronym DOOR, a desirability of outcome ranking. And so I'll give you an example of, of what this might look like. So typically the ARLG are using a five point ranking system with the worst outcome of course being death the best outcome being alive, but with no complications of either the antibiotic therapy or of the infection itself. And so you can then see there's intermediate scales depending on whether you uh, had clinical failure, whether you had uh, a particular complication uh, of the infection, or if you had an adverse effect leading to study drug discontinuation. And uh, so there's obviously this, this five point scale and patients on different therapies are compared uh, according to their outcome using this rank. Now, if you have a number of patients with the same rank in different therapies, uh, Scott Evans proposes then going to a tiebreaker. And the tiebreaker is based on your quality of life. So here we're sort of going beyond, um, you know, a live-die endpoint or just a microbiological endpoint to really looking at um, potentially how patients feel, function or survive. So their quality of life, um, was there a, a significant adverse effect from their antibiotic therapy? And so the aim with door endpoints is that potentially they may be more able to be used in superiority uh, designs to actually show that regimens uh, are separating apart, not just with live die or microbiological outcomes, but with a more integrated ordinal approach. Now in this um, little review, I, I just want to um, pick up on an issue which I think all of us conducting clinical trials uh, face. And that is that if we're doing uh, clinical trials for regulatory purposes, we find that there are typically a lot of exclusion criteria. And this is just um, a little extract from a, a one protocol that I've seen. And you can see that there were 32 exclusion criteria plus 
a supplementary lifestyle consideration request. So, you know, getting patients in, enrolled in trials when we have numerous exclusion criteria are really going to make trials quite inefficient because we'll screen many patients and not um, be able to include uh, even the majority of them because of various exclusion criteria. And one recent uh, paper, just very recently published in Lancet Infectious Diseases, was what's called the practical trial design, which is a personalized, randomized control, controlled trial design. And these authors um, really are proposing this as a new paradigm, particularly for settings like antibiotic treatment for carbapenem resistant infections. And at the beginning, I showed you the Acaeogen experience where th this was their uh, trial patient population, carbapenem resistant infections, and they had not many patients they ended up being able to recruit. In the practical design, basically every patient is potentially enrollable. But what happens is that each patient comes up with a, a personalized randomization list. So considering um, whether a drug option may potentially have an unacceptable toxicity for a patient. I'm thinking, for example, aminoglycosides or polymyxins because of nephrotoxicity. Um, potentially uh, a low efficacy option. Uh, for example, if you've got an NDM producer, there's going to be a lot of antibiotics that are not going to be um, an option for that particular patient or physician preference or even um, availability of a drug in a particular country. So each patient has a personalized randomization list. And then there is randomization from within that list. And treatment and follow-up as, as standard, but really a, a, a different concept. And this concept is based on the principles of network meta-analysis but really um, designed to be applied in a randomized controlled trial. And so, for example, we may end up with 10 or 12 or 14 different potential regimens that are being used um, in this trial. But depending on patient issues or even site issues, only a, a small number of those regimens will be actually um, applicable for any given patient. And so patients with the same uh, list of potential choices will be compared with other patients with the same list of potential choices. And using this network meta-analysis concept, for example, uh, drug uh, regimen A will be compared with drug regimen B which will be compared with drug regimen C, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's in the initial design, which is a little bit difficult to you know, explain in, in two minutes, it's likely and is most uh, useful to, I guess, weed out a very low rank or suboptimal regimen. Um, it might be that it cannot discriminate between uh, a number of regimens, but th that would you know, come into being then into clinical practice. There might be individual trade-offs of acceptable, um, but not really being able to tell one's better than another regimens. And it's possible that there might be a, a probably preferable uh, regimen that emerges from, from this type of um, investigation. So we're still uh, waiting to see more details. This study design has never been uh, used yet, but it's a very interesting concept where we could get rid of exclusion criteria altogether for some of these very resistant pathogens. 
So I'd like to just uh, finish with talking about a few of the pros and cons of, of these study designs and just start to introduce the concept of um, Bayesian adaptive designs, which Julie is going to go into in, in some detail. So um, as I mentioned, the purpose of all of these innovations is to improve the efficiency of trials, potentially enrol fewer patients, potentially have a shorter time to complete trials, potentially uh, have trials that are not going to cost $100 million, but uh, be much uh, less expensive to, uh, to initiate and complete. With the multi-arm, multi-stage uh, concept and also the practical concept where we, if we have multiple arms, if we're thinking of a registrational trial, I guess one of the issues is going to be if I'm uh, in a small company, am I going to take the chance um, of going head to head with multiple opponents? And that's something that, you know, I, I think it's a, it is a trade-off. The potential for having a, a much less expensive study, but uh, the potential that you you are going head to head with not just standard of care, but potentially other uh, new therapies. But it might be, for example, something that drug funders uh, insist on. If you're try, if we're going to help you get to phase three, you are going to have to face that you might have other uh, new antibiotics that we're supporting uh, going into this into this challenge. Practical, I've mentioned the concepts of network meta-analysis boiling down to a single RCT. Those methods are not yet uh, in the in the public domain. Um, the door endpoint, um, it could be very easily manipulated. So just say I'm going head to head with um, Calliston. I might say, well, look, I'd like to have um, one of my components being kidney toxicity. And for sure, um, if you've got a non-nephrotoxic drug, um, you could sort of tweak your ordinal outcomes so that you're improving your chances that your non-nephrotoxic drug will be compared with a nephrotoxic drug and one of the ordinal outcomes will be kidney toxicity, for example. And so I think we've got to be very fair and balanced when we uh, look at these ordinal outcomes in you know, what, do they, what are they really uh, showing. So I'd like to just um, finish by uh, introducing um, a bit of the, the concept of the response adaptive trial and really to um, you know, give, I guess, people a little bit of a balance that there are proponents and there are opponents. And I think that's true with, with many of the things we do in, in medicine or in drug uh, development. And there was this um, recent paper in, in clinical infectious diseases that looked at um, some of the issues with response adaptive randomization, which you'll hear from Julie very soon, things like bias from temporal trends, uh, are they truly um, the most efficient trial design? Um, is there going to be uh, some volatility in sample size distri distributions? It would be a concept where um, some people are not used to, to looking at the, the results. And I do need to point out that there were letters uh, written to the editor of Clinical Infectious Diseases, you know, against this, this uh, viewpoint paper. So uh, it's not all cut and dried, and that's why I think many of us are very eager to, uh, to listen to Julie's talk to, give, to hear her viewpoint on this. So just to conclude and, and reinforce uh, some of the, the big concepts, the way we're, think, we're doing things at the moment, drug A versus drug B, a frequentist design, uh, particularly when we're looking, for example, at 
an option where you know maybe we're going head to head in complicated urinary tract infection, is that really what clinicians or regulators really want? Can we do better? Can we make trials less expensive, quicker? Can they be more relevant to the issues of AMR? I do want to give a, a big plug to clinical trial networks. Clearly, they've got runs on the board for investigator-initiated trials including those with uh, significant engagement with industry. And I do believe they're emerging as an option for registrational trials. But again, a lot of the, the details, um, particularly of funding and particularly, uh, the I guess the challenges of pragmatism versus what we're used to with a CRO and with a, a regulatory uh, endpoint, how is that going to sort of pan out? Uh, I've mentioned MAMS, adaptive trials, practical, all with the aim um, to make trials more efficient, certainly more interesting uh, than just going A versus B. And finally, uh, considering uh, DOOR as potentially a primary superiority endpoint or potentially as a secondary exploratory endpoint, but certainly a concept worth exploring to go beyond just a single endpoint to perhaps something that's much more relevant to patients and really the activity of, of the drug. So thank you very much for your attendance and uh, I will stay in the background now uh, while we're waiting for the next talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for um, a very um, thought-provoking talk. And uh, uh, as usual, defer questions to the end. But just a reminder that people can uh, submit their questions uh, at any time. Um, but if you can just um, make it clear when you do that who you are addressing your question to, please. So uh, next, um, I have the pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Julie Marsh. Um, Julie is an experienced statistical consultant uh, who worked in the pharmaceutical industry for uh, many years uh, before returning to academia. She is the lead biostatistician in the West Farmer Centre of Vaccines and Infectious Diseases at the Telethon Kids Institute and a senior research fellow in the Adaptive Health Intelligence team, uh, which is co-located um, at the Telethon Kids Institute and the University of Sydney. She specialises in Bayesian adaptive clinical trials and statistical methods for detecting adverse events following immunisation. Her role in the Australian Clinical Trial Alliance involves training and mentoring the next generation of statistical trialists. Uh, welcome, Julie. You can start your presentation now. Thank you, Tom. And, and thank you, David, for a, a great introduction to uh, what's going to follow. Uh, apologies uh, for being a, a, a statistician, and obviously I couldn't resist a little bit of algebra in the slides that follow, but I have tried to minimise it. Sorry, I'm just having trouble with my slides. It's not moving forward. There we go. Oops. Okay. So the brief that I was given for doing this was to unpack the black box. So that's what I'm going to start with and hopefully we'll find lots of goodies within. I'm going to briefly touch on uh, why we need more efficient clinical trials, look at common features of adaptive trials, the core functionality of this, the decision-making process in adaptive trials, um, the changes we need in our trial governance and, and, and integrity, and how acceptable the, these designs are, are anyway, and then the implementation challenges we face in using these trial designs. The current trials that, that many of us are performing are, are fairly unresponsive uh, to consumer priorities. 
Uh, in, in addition, they don't always translate to trial results, and there are many uh, reasons for that. Um, they may be considered non-applicable to particular patient populations, uh, mismanagement between the commercial and the academic side, and also potential biases in design, management, and, and, re and reporting. Fundamentally, I think there's a failure to address heterogeneity and the complexity of, of, of modern diseases. And that's the main focus my talk will, will take today. We need the flexibility to drop interventions that don't improve the outcomes, to add new in interventions, and to keep recruiting if we're uh, to avoid inconclusive uh, results, or we even stop the trial if we believe by continuing it's going to be futile. We need, to, we need the potential to allocate more participants to better performing interventions, and we'd like to be able to evaluate those interventions in subpopulations to allow for that heterogeneity in our, in our target population. We'd also maybe like to be able to increase or stop recruitment in some of those sub subpopulations if it shows as the data is accumulating that, that one or other of, of the drugs doesn't actually work in, in that subgroup. And we'd like to evaluate things over multiple concurrent treatments rather than assuming our, our, our target population has a single disease and they only receive in one treatment at that point in time. And in some trials, you may even look to change uh, the primary endpoint during the, the, the trial. However, I won't be covering that in my talk today. So adaptive trials essentially have the same features as, as non-adaptive trials. The outcomes, however, the outcomes are repeatedly assessed on the accumulating data as the trial is ongoing. And the study design itself can be modified based on, really importantly, pre-specified rules. So these are written into the protocol and they, are, they aren't ad hoc decisions as the trial's ongoing. These are all reviewed prior to the trial starting and appropriate decision-making processes put in, in place. And under those conditions, we may change the trial design in, in documented ways. So one of those could be one of those features could be a sample size re reassessment. If if we look at the trial halfway through and we see that it's it's going to produce inconclusive re results, it's possible to increase the sample size to allow for that. Alternatively, if your effect size is is much larger than, than at first um, assumed to be, you may actually be finishing the trial earlier, publishing and getting and disseminating that, that those results at a much earlier point in time. The treatment selection way where we may wish to, to drop the poorer performing uh, um, candidates is commonly used in the pharmaceutical industry, but we can also use that uh, in investigator-led trials. Seamless designs um, allow, allow greater e e efficiency rather than our dogged sequential one trial after the other answering one question and at a time. Response adaptive randomization, as David covered earlier, allows us to allocate more, more participants to the better performing treatments if we use the appropriate algorithms. And also enrichment, if we find that uh, um, some treatments work better in some subgroups of our target population rather than, than others. The idea of targeting a particular population for a particular drug under investigation. And finally, the area that I'm, I'm most active in is platform trials, where we look at multiple treatments and populations evaluated simultaneously for efficacy. So just taking you through, just to just give you a pictorial um, view of, of what these different trials look like. Um, I believe my mouse works. So up here we have the traditional design where individuals are randomized. And then you just keep going on a fixed design to the very end and perform a final analysis. With the sample size reassessment at a fixed point in time, which is decided in advance of the first patient being randomized, an assessment is done. And in this case, rather than continuing with a 
two more patients on each arm, it's decided that four more patients are needed on each arm to produce conclusive trial results at the end of it. So sample size reassessment, and it can go in either direction. You may need a smaller sample size, you may need a greater one. So treatment selection when arm dropping is another feature that, that could be incorporated. In this case, there's a high, medium, and low dose. At the first interim, the high dose is dropped, the medium dose, a clear decision whether to proceed with, but that one is, is uh, arrived at, um, but it's unknown about the low dose. And so those two treatments continue forward in, into uh, the, the next stage. And there may or may not be a break. Traditionally, this break is minimized as much as possible, that break in time. Okay, for the seamless zip design, it's fairly similar to what you saw with the arm drop-in. But in this one, as you can see, the high dose has been dropped. These two doses continue forward. But to use that slot, we've introduced another treatment arm down here. In this case, an introduction of a standard of care or, or placebo. So this may be commonly used if you're, if you're doing a phase two, three sort of seamless design in the pharmaceutical industry, where you might do your dose finding here and your, your candidates, which are most promising, continue forward into the pivotal trial and you bring in whatever the standard of care, whether that's placebo or, or other treatments in your confirmatory trial moving forward. And you could even, in this point, also have interim analysis performed to look at the sample size re-evaluation. So you can stop as soon as you have sufficient evidence to go to a regulatory filing. And then in a response adaptive randomization, the number of patients allocated to each treatment is proportional to how well that treatment is performing. So in this case, I've still only built in one interim analysis just to make it easy, but generally there's multiple interims. And in this one, the high dose again didn't work. So in this case, the probability of allocating any patients to that arm it drops to zero. In this one, it works very well. So we increase the allocation ratio as for future randomizations. And in this one, we're not sure. So we keep the allocation ratio at what it was previously. In an enrichment design, we're concentrating on the population. So in the, in the first stage, up until the first interim, you see there's a similar number recruited from each population. And then following that re-evaluation of the sample size moving forward, it's decided that there's better efficacy within this, this group. So we recruit more individuals there and similarly more individuals for both treatment arms for the final analysis over here. In some cases, you may choose to completely drop rec recruiting for one particular group. And those are the enrichment designs. So beyond the simple adaptive trial designs, you may hear the term umbrella trial. So in this case, there's one population but many drugs. For example, breast cancer, maybe population A, you can try new therapeutics and, and existing standard of care treatments. You could even group some of those treatments into domains. These may all have similar mode of actions, but be produced by, by different pharmaceutical companies. So the umbrella trial is a single population or disease, and you investigate multiple drugs. With a basket trial in comparison, this is often done in, in the smaller pharmaceutical companies where they have a single drug that's been developed, for example, drug one here, and they don't know which population it's gonna work in. So this may be a range of cancers, such as breast cancer, prostate cancers, um, down here. So in a basket trial, you have the single drug and it's evaluated over multiple populations or maybe over multiple diseases to see in which one it works. The platform trial has an added level of complexity in which there's many populations that so may be 
many subgroups of a single disease, or it may be across multiple, for example, um, cancer tumor types. And then there's a range of drugs, and those drugs may be given individually, or they may be, in this case, if they're grouped into domain A and domain B, you may have one drug selected from domain A and one from B. So you're looking at concurrent drugs simultaneously evaluated within the same protocol. So the platform trial is more what you would think along the lines of factorial designs. The common feature of all of these types of trials is there's often a master protocol which they all follow. And then if you have things such as drugs grouped under domains, you may have appendices that cover those, or if the different populations have slightly different endpoints, you may have uh, appendices relating to those subpopulations. The trial may be open-ended or even perpetual, as you see in some platform trials. And the advantages that we often use is with, with Bayesian methods, we can share, or it's also called borrow information, across drugs or populations to make the trial more efficient. So the very early work was all, all done by um, uh, Scott Berry, Jason Connor, and um, Roger Lewis from, from uh, Berry Consultants. And it's also been taken up by other groups across the world. I'm going to give you a quick graphic to give you a rough idea. This is my very basic graphic of roughly how a platform trial works prospectively. You have the concept of recruiting a particular population and they may have access to a range of interventions that they're randomized to. But, and then the other populations similarly can get randomized to those same interventions. We could add an event, uh, in, um, sorry, intervention as the trial's ongoing. We may find uh, intervention doesn't work across multiple subpopulations. Or you may find an intervention doesn't work in particular populations, as you see it's disappearing here and here. And so either a whole, a whole intervention can be dropped across all populations or just across an individual population. Interventions can be introduced across all those uh, subgroups as well. So going across time, it's common, it's common to have a registry from which you uh, re recruit and potentially you can have non-randomizing uh, individuals may consent to have their data stored in the registry while the trial itself it involves randomization to interventions. So in this particular example, you can see we have our first domain with four treatment options. As we go forward in time, we recruit more people, okay? and we do our first interim analysis with those open circles with no decisions being made. We then continue forward to the next interim, and a whole set of new interventions are introduced for domain B. Going forward again, another intervention is also included at the same time. More people are recruited. The interim continues with no decision being made. And then going forward in time, you can see the open circles and the crosses refer to treatments being dropped. And we continue with those interventions until we have a decision that's made to drop. Other than that, we continue to recruit to the remaining interventions within those domains across time. And then occasionally we will reach a trial con conclusion. And when this domain conclusion down here has been met, everybody continues on this single intervention. So we implement the best treatment option as the trial is ongoing. And I'll just run to the end of this. And at the end of the trial, when we hit the maximum recruitment, we have conclusions for all the treatments which work. So in this case, we would be looking at these two are either equivalent or non-inferior. There's a superior treatment in this domain and a superior treatment in that domain. So fundamental to all of this is our ability to make decisions. 
So the MAM studies that you were shown earlier is based on frequentist methods and decisions are made around p-values being above, being below a, a certain threshold. Um, I work within the Bayesian uh, framework just because it's much easier to do our decision making and it's much easier to communicate those, those uh, d d d decisions. Both are valid methods for, uh, for running uh, an adaptive trial. It will usually depend on which statistician uh, you work with. So the FDA have a definition of a uh, adaptive trial. They talk about the concept there are design parameters and they can change. It has to be based on a priori rules. And those rules are based on accumulating data. And we will still need to achieve the common goals of validity and scientific efficiency and safety. However, uh, it's always easier just to follow a diagram. So we enroll patients, we randomize them, we record their outcomes, we update our database, we perform an interim analysis, we make a decision, and is that decision to either terminate the trial or to continue based on, on our, on our uh, quantities of interest and our thresholds. Okay, if we continue, we may or may not update the randomization weights uh, for the treatment allocations, depending if we're using response adaptive randomization or not. And we continue to enroll, randomize, and go around this loop until we reach the point that we've either maximized our resources, so it's our maximum sample size, or we've reached a uh, decision rule, in which case we uh, report our results. Okay, so just to unpack that black box just a little bit further in terms of a little bit of uh, um, algebra here. So if we had a simple sample size reassessment trial with two arms, we have treatment A and B, and we want to know is treatment B superior to A? So we denote the proportion cured on treatment A as uh, uh, P subscript A, and on B is P subscript B. And from that, we can calculate the difference between those two proportions. And our null hypothesis is where the um, is where the difference is less than zero. So A has a higher cure rate than B. And under the alternative, if B has a higher cure rate than A, then the difference will be greater than zero. That gives us our alternate and null hypothesis for anyone any frequentists out there who wants to be put in a familiar framework. Okay, so at each interim analysis, we go through a series of steps. We calculate our posterior distribution and we estimate the probability of the alternate hypothesis given that current data. So this is an interim analysis. We're going around those circles, evaluating, accumulating data, and when we hit the criteria for performing the first interim analysis. Step one, we perform the analysis, we calculate the posterior distribution, and we estimate for that alternate hypothesis, we want to know the probability that that difference is greater than zero. Okay, in step two, we compare this probability to our predefined thresholds. Now, our thresholds were, were um, arrived at through uh, simulation prior to writing the protocol, and they're all defined in the protocol up front. So in this case, we're going to use a threshold value of 95%. So if the probability of that difference is greater than zero, i.e. B cure rate is greater than A, is greater than 95%, then when the going to declare B as superior and we'll stop the trial early. But it's always good to write a futility in as well. So if your trial really isn't showing anything, we also want to stop early. So in this case, if the probability that B is greater than A is less than 1%, then we're going to declare the trial futile and we're going to stop early. 
So step three is implementing that, that, that decision rule. So if the maximum sample size has been met, when we stop the trial. If the superiority or the futility thresholds are met, again, we stop recruiting, and otherwise we just continue. In response adaptive randomization, if there are two treatment arms, the optimal treatment allocation will always be 50-50 or one-to-one -one, uh, between those two arms. If there are two treatment arms, you can consider response adaptive randomization. But it does require a short time between the recruitment and the participant outcome. Yeah, so when they're recruited and when the outcome is available, and that's relative to the overall trial recruitment period. So if you have a long time to the patient outcome, response adaptive randomization is very hard to implement and is not recommended. And in general, in a superiority framework, i.e. when none of the treatments are efficacious, then the MAMS group sequential designs are slightly more efficient than response adaptive randomization. What we don't know is in the non-feriority framework, which we often may be faced with in investigator-led trials, if, 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 and, and also in antibiotic studies, if one design is more efficient than the other. So it's ongoing research. Yet there are concerns that response adaptive randomization causes problems, but by chance, if you do have a higher B cure rate than the true value, if you increase the allocations to B, you're just going to return, it's going to be a faster return to the true value. So even if you do temporarily allocate more to B, you'll just get a faster return to the true value. If by chance there's a lower A cure rate than the true value for A, the reduced allocations to treatment A will slow your return to the true value. So this really is your greatest concern. Um, so we have run-in periods where we delay performing the interim uh, analysis and then switching on response adaptive randomization to allow the system just to come into a little bit more, uh, become a little bit more robust, a little bit more stable. To put all of this in, pl in, in place, there are the other concerns often raised is if people know what the results are, particularly if they know what the response adaptive randomization allocation uh, probabilities are, there are concerns that that can cause either uh, selection bias or operational bias in a clinical trial. So to account for that, we have the typical three committee structure, uh, or we recommend using the typical three committee structure in terms of the trial steering committee, which is the executive decision-making group, the trial management group who runs the day-to-day -day, uh, delivery and conduct of the trial, and then the independent data safety monetary committee for the review of the interim safety, uh, and, and also efficacy and uh, data quality. For the complex trials, we do recommend having a separate statistical subcommittee just to stop the, the, the team getting too big, making important decisions when writing the protocol and, and, and the SAP up front. But then most importantly is to build a firewall around the analytic team and to, and to control the communication and information in and out of, of this group. It's important that as few people as possible know what the interim results are throughout the entire running of the trial until publication of, of results. The integrity itself is really governed by that information flow around the system. So we have the trial data coming in here, including the treatment allocations. We have all the information going to the analytic team, but the analytic team only producing reports for the closed session of the data safety and monitoring committee. There are other Blinded, report, um, um, yeah, blinded reports also sent to the Data Safety Monitoring Committee to talk about trial progress. The Data Safety and Monitoring Committee can then provide blinded recommendations. Yeah? So we don't want the Trial Steering Committee unblinded. 
they provide those recommendations for the decisions and the adaptations to the trial steering committee, who then implement them back to the start of the trial and the continued enrolment. And this information can be covered in the trial integrity document. Are they acceptable? So I'm going to race through the last few slides now. Well, they're certainly acceptable to uh, the FDA and also the European uh, uh, Medicine uh, Association. And I should say it no longer includes the UK now, either, does it? So uh, also to um, uh, regulators in the UK. Okay. And they've even produced guidance uh, information for industry in, in particular. And there's also a, a lot has been published. There's more that's been published on conducting an adaptive trial than actual the number of adaptive trials currently running or in um, or on the clinical trial registries as well. So there are lots of publications guiding you through uh, conducting the, these types of trials. In addition to that, uh, there are publications about how to write master protocols. For example, this publication was by uh, J uh, Janet Pocock, who uh, was very seen. I believe she's left the FDA now, but uh, you know, it really does come from the top re regulators uh, globally in support of these adaptive trials. There are more hesitation on accepting them for confirmatory trials, though, but that is changing which you may have noticed with, with the uh, COVID-19 vaccine applications. So this is for the Pfizer vaccine, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. It's a seamless phase one, two, three um, clinical trial. Uh, one of the fastest vaccine trials I think I've ever seen from start to regulated research at submission and even into rollout now. Uh, these are two trials for, um, from our own group. So what I would recommend if you're going to embark on adaptive trials is start very simply. Um, so we, uh, these are two vaccine studies that we've performed here, which have been published. So um, there is also, um, I would recommend looking in, into uh, the published literature on protocols and see what sort of designs are already out there. Um, just to keep collecting information, but do start simple. Uh, the height of complexity has to be the remap cap trial, uh, which is pr producing amazing re the results now around its uh, the subpopulation that it has with uh, with, with COVID, uh, and just the speed of being able to uh, adapt the protocol to add in new arms, to add in different populations and strata, and to get these results analysed with the existing infrastructure uh, is is astounding. There have been criticisms, obviously, as well. The other thing where we have the flexibility with these adaptive trial designs is incorporating adults and children all within the same protocol. I'm delighted to say I'm involved in, in two platform studies which have adults and children simultaneously informing each other's treatment uh, 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 estimates in the form of, of uh, BCF in um, cystic fibrosis and the SNAP trial with um, Staph aureus bacteremia. So keep it simple, they're not always use useful. There are criticisms of these designs as well. So here's an article that David showed earlier, and also another one which is concerned about non-comparability of the control group as well. So you'll see just as much written against adaptive trials as you will pro-adaptive uh, trials. Uh, the most common criticisms, as David mentioned, was the temporal change and non-concurrent controls. However, we can model that out with appropriate statistical techniques. Response adaptive randomization, I think we've probably talked about far too much today. Uh, there's a few, a few ways that we can deal with that. The potential for selection and operational bias can be dealt with in terms of trial governance and, and uh, documenting uh, information sharing within a, a trial integrity document. 
Um, but our, our main problem will always be the, the shortage of, of researchers and the greater statistical burden, and also the knowledge gap in terms of the ethics committees and the data safety monitoring uh, committees. The one group I haven't met any resistance from is our consumer represents, uh, representatives on our trials. They seem to welcome it with open, open arms. The, but there is a global need for training and capacity building in this area. There are many challenges. Um, I've listed a few of them in here, um, and there are many publications on all, all of those as well. One of the greatest challenges is the, t is the data office as well, collecting the data efficiency, getting it cleaned up, not having missing data, small lab samples uh, in, in your batches being analyzed, turned around very quickly, and the electronic systems. And we've even taken it one step forward, and, and we're currently running a fully automated trial the vaccine reminders that run off uh, GP uh, databases. So in the interest of time, I hope you have unpacked that box for you. And this is a picture from the Australian uh, master chef with a delicious dessert. Hopefully you'll find adaptive trials are. And if you're looking for further resources, just to finish off today, that we have our own resource hub here, which is the Adaptive Health Intelligence uh, website with um, videos, uh, descriptions of adaptive trials. And also if you go to Berry Consultants, they have, very, they have a few, uh, quite a few, there's a library of webinars and information there if you seek more information. So uh, good luck with your trials. I hope you've enjoyed the uh, presentations today. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, we have time for questions, uh, so we'll start the Q&A session uh, now. A reminder again uh, for the audience that you can submit your questions uh, as shown on this slide. Uh, please remember to include the name of the speaker that you are addressing the question to. We'll do our best to respond to as many of the questions as we can in the time that we have uh, available. So uh, we do already have uh, some questions, um, but please um, keep them coming. Um, the first question uh, I will address uh, to David. Um, David, um, these new trial designs um, and use of uh, MAMS and uh, door outcomes, uh, for example, um, have they uh, been used to your knowledge yet for uh, completely novel um, antibiotics? Um, and do you know uh, whether regulators and uh, healthcare payers uh, are accepting these, these designs? Yeah, so uh, with regards to DOOR, uh, the ARLG has a, a working group which includes, I think, FDA representatives and they're systematically going through, for example, complicated UTI, complicated intra-abdominal infections, skin and soft tissue infections, to basically come up with a, a standardised door uh, outcome that could be used in, in regulatory uh, trials. And I know they're doing a bit of uh, back testing on um, existing clinical trial data to, to look at that. So I think that uh, end point is certainly um, moving ahead. With MAMS, I'm not as sure yet with regards to antibiotics, um, but it would certainly seem a sort of a logical step, particularly that sort of seamless going from phase two to phase three to, to sort of increase the efficiency of of trials. Thank you, David. Um, David, uh, another question for you. Um, it relates to, I guess, the generalizability of the results of antibiotic trials in Europe and North America to other settings like India. Um, if a new compound is shown to be effective in um, Europe or North America or Australia, uh, should 
those trials be repeated in Asia or um, in, in other settings uh, with potentially different um, uh, antibiotic uh, susceptibility patterns? Uh, and if so, how should those trials be done and, and how big should they, should they be? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. And there was a, a recent paper in Clinical Infectious Diseases where they looked at uh, geographic trends in enrolment in registra registrational trials. And some people may or may not know that, for example, complicated urinary tract infections, more than 80% of uh, patients enrolled were actually in Eastern Europe. And I think it was something like only 3% of patients were enrolled in the United States. So there, there seems to be um, almost this sort of concentration of clinical trials activity um, in certain parts of the world for certain indications. So there, there's clearly some um, urologists or infectious diseases people in Eastern Europe who have cornered the, the market and obviously they conduct their trials very, very well. Um, I, I think the, the big question is, uh, has the trial covered the the organism of interest. So, you know, if you've designed a new antibiotic and its activity is against Acinetobacter, and that's its its special feature, um, why you would be um, doing your registrational studies, you know, for for urinary tract infections, that doesn't make sense at all to me. And and it's often the easiest pathway to get approval, the cheapest pathway to get approval. But uh, you know, I would really be recommending that, um, in particularly with that welcome uh, clinical trials network in Asia, you know, to go go where the action is, and uh, that's where where the studies should be done. So one really good example is Entasis, uh, their Acinetobacter trial uh, was predominantly in China and now has expanded to some other um, countries where there's a lot of, of Acinetobacter and I don't see that that would need to be replicated. Um, you know, if it's going after the target organism, I don't really care about the country. But some of those syndrome specific um, trials, that's what sort of anno <laughs> annoys me. I'd harp on about that all night. <laughs> um, so David, are you suggesting um pathogen targeted trials rather than syndrome targeted trials or? I think, you know, because our antibiotics are being developed, you know, they're not being developed um, by the chemists as, oh, let's find a, um, you know, a complicated intra-abdominal infection drug. They're being developed because of, of their activity against certain resistance profiles. And that's why I think the, the more the pathogen specific uh, activity is what's important to demonstrate clinically. Yeah, there's a parallel there, isn't there, with uh, cancer chemotherapy targeting specific targets that might be across multiple cancer cancer types. Mm. Yeah. Um, Julie, a uh, question for you. Um, do you know of any evidence that adaptive trials have better recruitment rates than than non-adaptive trials? No, but that, that frequently comes up. Unfortunately, we haven't collected the information on, on, on it yet. Um, it, 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 would be, it would be a great cherry on top of the cake if we find that is the case, because certainly the consumer reps in those um, uh, who advise us on our trials are, are very enthusiastic about it. Thanks, um, Julie. So there was actually a, a question about um, uh, consumer representation and, and uh, how responsive they have been to um, adaptive design. So I think you've already answered that, that question. Um, can you speak perhaps to the potential resource savings um, from implementing adaptive compared to uh, more traditional designs? Uh, oh gosh, yeah, that's quite a long answer. Uh, I'll keep it short. 
Um, so the, the, the improvements that people generally talk about are in terms of power, um, efficiency, and also participant be benefit. I'll keep completely away from the participant benefit side of things and the ethics, ethical side of things. Um, in terms of re resources, um, the many of the simulations that, that, that are performed and, and the papers that have been published uh, to date indicate you need a smaller trial size, um, but it also depends on the methodology that, that you're using. So I can only really comment on the, on the, the Bayesian methods where we leverage information between um, for example, if it was a dose response, we'd use other doses of, of the same drug to share information. Um, if we anticipate um, some patient groups having similar similarities between them, we'd try and leverage information in that way, and what we call borrow information or information sharing to gains that way. So usually the resource implications are in terms of a shorter trial duration, a, a um, smaller number of, of individuals and, and often in terms of, you know, because we drop um, uh, non-performing um, treatments early, you really are optimizing the, the, the in theory, optimizing the care of, of, of remaining participants in, in the trial. There is that leading period where the trial takes much longer to initiate, you need a much greater infrastructure in place. I can, I, I could highly recommend working with established clinical trial networks that David referred to as well, and all of our platform trials have used that. So sorry, Tom, far too long to answer that question. <laughs> can can I just um, butt in yeah. for a second, Tom? Just, uh, you know, you asked Julie about the uh, consumers, the participants, and uh, adaptive trial designs and informed consent, etc. You know, I, I have to say that um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to editorialise <laughs> and rant a little bit here, but I think there is a solution. You know, our um, ethics committees or I, IRBs, you know, the patient information sheets that we give to the potential participants are usually six or seven or more pages and you know are complicated um, even though they're, they're supposed to be for lay people and I think there is time that's really ripe for radical approaches to how do we communicate with potential participants and I really want to do a shout out for the people involved in the SNAP trial which is a an adaptive platform trial of Staphylococcus aureus treatments. They've produced a series of short videos which are for the information of potential participants or their families. And I, you know, I do think um, we've got to give a lot of thought to, you know, what do we communicate or what do consumers really want? You know, do they need to know all the ins and outs of, oh, you've got these domains and you've got this response adaptive and what you know what's all this this mean i think there's ways we can simplify and you know what is is the acceptable minimum that we can communicate and what is the way you know is it is it this six or eight page um written document or is there something um more efficient that we can use thanks thanks david um, David, uh, <laughs> this, this might take a long time to, to answer, but there's a question about um, the practical and logistical issues that you encountered when setting up the Merino trial network going into so many different countries. How, 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 did, you, how did you do it and, and do you have advice for, <laughs> for, for setting up um, those those sorts of uh, trials and and doing it uh, as efficiently and cheaply as you you managed to do it. So I, I remember talking to one of my Italian uh, collaborators who ended up being an investigator, and he said, um, in Italy, every hospital uh, has an office, and it's called the office for making simple things complicated. <laughs> and uh, I think any of us who've tried to get um, you know, governance approvals for multi-site trials, know that what should be a pretty simple and clean process gets 
can get really bogged down. So, you know, luckily in our team, we had, um, you know, a lawyer who uh, would work with us in, in getting all the site agreements. And, uh, you know, in this particular example, the University of Queensland was the sponsor. And, uh, you know, for an academic institution to sort of um, be involved in, you know, nine countries and all sorts of <laughs> different twists and permutations, uh, but the, you know, the university had clinical trials insurance, um, you know, a good coordinator team. And I think what the real secret was is that we had very engaged investigators. And, you know, if doctors at the sites really want to do a trial, you know, we only paid the sites $500 per enrolled patient. So they weren't in it for the money. They were really there to answer an important clinical question. And that is an issue for us doing infectious diseases trials. You know, it's not like um, we're salvage therapy for brain cancer, where you know, oh, you know, I really got to, got, I've got to be on to a, onto a trial. You know, particularly if it's a registrational trial for a a new drug, what's in it for the patient? Um, and so you've got to have an engaged team of of in, investigators who are able to communicate that to their the potential participants. So yeah, I won't go into all the the gory details, but you you do need a team of ten or so um, who are really uh, engaged in a variety of different different processes. But it's possible. Thanks, thanks, David. Um, Julie, did can you talk? perhaps to the workforce issues, um, if uh, people are interested in setting up uh, these sorts of adaptive designs, um, is it likely that the closest biostatistician or clinical trials group will, will know where to, where to start? Oh gosh, I would say the major networks uh, statistical networks um, that I work with are, are really in, in America and only small pockets in the US and also um, uh, the MRC uh, adaptive trials sort of hub, um, clinical trials hub um, out of the UK as, as, as well. Um, I think it's very small pockets and you have to hunt them down and they're very much in demand, and to a large extent, they have um, they have been taken up into the pharmaceutical industry as well, as they've really embraced a lot of this. Um, uh, so it's much harder to find an academic stat stat statistician. And the, we are constantly updating our work our workflow and our and our models of trying to estimate exactly how much these trials cost to do. But over the period of five five years, we started very very small. We started by just a um, a sample size reestimation trial, and then we built up on a more complicated and then a more complicated uh, design over years. And platform trials can take you know two to three years to get up and running anyway, even after you have the funding to even start to design them. I don't have a single simple solution for the um, uh, for that. There are initiatives going on in in Australia, which Tom has has has, has led to increase the uh, uh, to capacity build around you know both for the trialists and for for, for, the, for the statisticians, providing websites and training. We put on one or two workshops a year in Australia. Similar things have been ongoing in the UK, and there's also the Panda initiative in the UK, which is building up a, a, a repository of, of information. Um, but there is very little substitute for um, particularly a, a trialist and, and a statistician with experience of, of running these trials at the moment, unfortunately. I'm going to butt in. Um, a colleague told who worked for, had worked for a pharmaceutical company as a statistician, uh, I think had a team of seven or eight and that team was broken up. And one of the reasons why we may now have a, a shortage of good statisticians is that more than half of his team were rec recruited by sports betting companies. So that, <laughs> that might be part of the reason why we have a, uh, 
a shortage of people who really know what to do. There's there's other opportunities to play with numbers. It, it used to be the hedge fund managers. Now it's the sports <laughs> betting companies. Uh, thanks, thanks, David. David, um, this or this could be a question for either of you. Um, just getting back to the issue of uh, pathogen targeted studies. Um, often, uh, I guess, in the real world, uh, people have um, polymicrobial infections, um, I guess, especially for complicated gut uh, infections, for example. Um, do you know how uh, these sort of innovative designs might enable us to um, to uh, to assess the impact of uh, of potentially combinations of drugs for for polymicrobial um, uh, infections? My gut reaction is that I would normally exclude people with polymicrobial infections because it just makes it very hard to, um, you know, does drug A, um, you know, did it did its activity contribute to the outcome or was it um, the confounding effect of the treatment for the other significant infection? So that that's my I hate to have exclusions, but um, <laughs> polymicrobial infections might be might be one. But Julie might have clever ways of uh, dealing with that. I can think of modelling solutions, but I would I would want to. Uh, I'm hesitant to say too much now. It can be modelled uh, theoretically. I haven't seen it done in practice, and as you said, the uh, these individuals currently aren't recruited into clinical trials, so it's very hard to um, to even know what, uh, what to expect. The advantage of running a, a registry from which you recruit into the platform trial is that we could be collecting this information and maybe getting some more background information um, on on these. Uh, they're usually a smaller a smaller percentage of, of the whole as well. So there's all problems with there being smaller groups. But in the Bayesian framework, obviously, you could always put prior distributions on, on that. Um, you get some shrinkage down so you don't get you know anything too too wild in your treatment estimates. Um, but yeah, no, I don't have a simple solution for that at the moment, sorry. I guess Thank on you. A, a vaguely sort of related note, you know, one issue that comes up is, um, can you be enrolled in more than one trial at the same time? And this is often ex an exclusion. Um, you know, you're in, enrolled in the study of another, um, or, or in another study. And I think most study management committees now would have a process whereby they review potential co-enrolment in, in trials so that I think a much more pragmatic way of thinking is that you can have people in multiple uh, trials at the same time. Um, you know, obviously this needs to be assessed on a case by case basis. Um, but again, there's nothing worse than, uh, you know, going to recruit someone and, oh, they're in a, a trial of a cancer agent and therefore, no, no, you're not allowed to uh, to recruit my patient into this this study, which has got nothing to, you know, to do with the success of breast cancer treatment or whatever. So, sorry, that's nothing to do with polymicrobial infections, but it's poly, poly recruiting into trials. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, we've now come to the end of the, uh, the, the time for the Q&A session. Uh, thank you to everyone for submitting your, your questions and sorry we didn't get to get to all of them. Uh, but I would uh, like to thank you all uh, uh, again and thank especially uh, David Patterson and Julie Marsh for very thought-provoking talks and, and hopefully in uh, five, ten years' time we will be thinking back that we heard it first uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this session. So I'll now hand back to you, Astrid. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for moderating the webinar. And uh, as I want to join you in thanking, of course, our speakers, Julie and David, uh, thank you for your very interesting presentations. And of course, I would also like to thank our audience for joining and for, for 
um, contributing with their questions. We've already received some very nice feedback, so um, keep it coming in the uh, post-webinar survey. Uh, one thing I want to point out to the audience also is that in a few weeks' time, you will uh, receive a follow-up email from this uh, webinar. And in this email, you will also have a link to download your um, certificate of attendance. And finally, I would like to point you to our next Revive webinar, which will take place on the 10th of June. It's a very different webinar. It's not about the scientific facts, but more about where to find information. So it will be about openly accessible resources for the global antimicrobial R&D community. There we will have a presentation of an AMR podcast about a presentation of the openly available resources by the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. And also I will take the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing with Revive. So that's all from my side. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the webinar and that you will uh, join us for the future webinars. Thank you and goodbye.